Good morning. Uh, my name is, is Manuel Portela. I am a researcher at the, the TIC department and the Web Science and Social Computing Group. And we um, we wanted to, to start this, this meeting. Um, this, this is like an inquiry about how the AI Act um, uh, impacts or, or, or has, uh, let's say, some uh, arms towards the, the research and the academic uh, field. Uh, so, okay, why we are doing this? Uh, the idea is to open up uh, the discussion because this uh, is very recent and incipient and uh, emerging uh, discussion about how to implement trustworthy AI in the in European Union. And as you will see, the, the, the the act, the, the, the regulation is not, uh, let's say, implemented yet, but uh, it's a good opportunity to us to discuss what are the, let's say, uh, implications uh, on, on our work, on, on, the, on the society. And this is also important um, to us because, the, the, as you know, the UPF supports uh, uh, the development of the planetary well-being. Uh, and, and this uh, meeting is supported for the for the Maria Maetsu um, strategic program on AI uh, that the DETIC has. So this is important. Also, it's uh, supported by the AI Boost project. This is a project that we started a few months ago, a European um, project. Uh, we are trying to support uh, SMEs and startups on the AI uh, ecosystem. And for us, it's, uh, it's important to participate in the, in the UPF, not only because uh, we are a very, um, let's say, uh, good uh, uh, research. Uh, also, we are looking forward to, to work in the transfer technology and involved in the ethic AI uh, ecosystem. So um, this is why uh, this uh, meeting is like a star starting point for a series of activities that we are uh, trying to approach uh, during the next years. Uh, so this is a first debate, but we are opening uh, what we call a space uh, for debate on re responsible AI and general ethics on projects. This will be a, a pilot program that we will launch this year for the our, our research uh, um, department, but also if other departments are, are will also invite it. Uh, the idea is that if you have projects, uh, even uh, a PhD project or a research project or a t a technology transfer, and you are curious about what are the limits or the impact of your project uh, in terms of the uh, responsible AI or data governance, etc., uh, we can help you on, on this matter. We have experience in, in, in the sector, industrial sector, and also um, and technology transfer. So we can discuss this as an open space for, for trying to achieve and, and to prevent any social harm, etc. Also, we are working uh, on a mock, on a specific course on these topics that we will try to publish uh, probably at the at mid-2024 mid uh, for all the researchers as a pilot, uh, internal pilot for the UPF. Also, if you have a project or any inquiry, etc., you will have this. You can point this this form. Uh, you can write us anytime. So, going to the debate and and, and the time. I'm, uh, well, I'm Evan Portela. We are here with with Annabel Arias. Uh, she's a lawyer and she's uh, from the SEC. When I go right, maybe you can present yourself later. Uh, also, Migle. Uh, she's from the law department. Tenure track professor and uh, Natalie, uh, another uh, postdoc researcher here for the, the TIC. Um, so, the idea is that we have different visions on the impact of the AI Act, and we will share with you some, some of the thinkings. Uh, and we will we save a lot of time for you to, to raise your hand and, and to comment on this. So, uh, we will do like very brief presentations, and then we will have to. To, to this this moment of debate. So first, some definitions about the AI Act. Uh, as you know, 
uh, well, maybe don't, but the Act is a very, very complex uh, regulation, very law, large law, also uh, from the first draft, uh, which was uh, two or three years ago. Uh, it was increasing on, on its size, so it's much more longer than the GDPR and much more complex. So it's really hard to get to, to see what are the implications, and there's a lot of debate on how this will be implemented, because uh, this is the timeline, more or less, we are in the beginning, and yet uh, we have um, time to different phases of uh, implementations, we need uh, some uh, organizations and institutions to be set up, etc. So uh, this is just the first, uh, we have, sorry, we have, internet issues, as I expected. Um, so the Zoom disconnected. Okay, I will continue. So, uh, the grounds or the basis of this law is the trustworthy AI uh, concept. This uh, was from, I don't know, uh, started from the high level expert group in the commission. They set up uh, different settings about, um, sorry, I need to share, I don't know what happened with the Zoom. Um, different uh, conceptual uh, background that maybe you need to be fa to familiarize with it. Uh, so I, I encourage you to, to check it out. Um, okay. So what the, the, the law regulates, right? Uh, because this is uh, it's not uh, uh, everything uh, on AI, but it regulates, uh, regulates a specific uh, implementation. First, um, what is called uh, placing on the market or putting into service. This is a commercial implementation of AI, right? Uh, it prohibits some practices and also establish some specific high risk uh, uh, requirements. Um, and then uh, regular, regulates the uh, interaction with other regulations, uh, which is also will be commented here, uh, and other rules on the uh, market, right? Uh, it's very, at the end, is very commercial oriented, is very uh, oriented on the product itself, right? So this does not regulate anything related to applied research or development uh, within um, systems or model that are uh, developed before placing into the market. Uh, also, any system that is uh, developed only for scientific or, 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 or research, right? So we are uh, maybe... Uh, safe here in the house somehow. Uh, if you are developing any AI just for the internal purposes, also doesn't apply uh, if you are using or developing system in a personal, uh, let's say in a personal uh, implementation. So it's not professional at all, right? Uh, also there are other exclusions that we don't approach here, but everything that has to do with military or national security or police, etc. cetera, um, in some, in some uh, categories are not are not regulated. Uh, also, excludes any technology implemented outside the EU territories, which is uh, controversial somehow. Um, but all the ethical and professional standards apply anyway, right? So even though uh, doesn't regulate the the research, uh, it does uh, require some some standards, right? Some definitions about what uh, it's meant be about on the market into service. This is uh, some uh, tricky words that they use, right? When he said uh, making avail available on the market, it means that this uh, implementing a course of a commercial activity, right? Uh, so it could be paid or will be free, but it's there for being implemented, right? And this maybe has to do a lot with open source as well. Um, and put it into the service means that uh, it's it's working for a specific intended purpose. And this is also tricky because what is a purpose? Well, for the definition of the law, the purpose is what uh, is set for, right? So the provider, the, the person that um, creates and develops or the company, 
uh, defines a per uh, purpose, right? So this is promoted or this is um, advertised as uh, having some um, specific uh, benefit, and this is the purpose. So if it's uh, not working on that side, uh, it's not really implemented or not into service. And also the performance in, the, in terms of the law is regarding to this purpose. It's not performance related to maybe specific uh, metrics that we use in, in, in the development of, of a system. And lately, the definition of an AI system was also tricky. Uh, it includes a machine-based system. It's not another kind of system that does not include machine. And its main goal or main um, uh, service is to infer, right, for the definition. So any inference could be considered uh, uh, AI system. And it could be a product itself or embed in, in, in a different product. It doesn't include what is called uh, automated decision making in a traditional way, for example, for, for execute operation or automate uh, any system, right? Uh, that is not infer doing an inference, right? So all the software system and programming only based on, on rule base or et cetera are not included here. Uh, so machine based uh, again. And the inference principle uh, is interesting. And then what is called general purpose AI, maybe you hear about large language models or generative AI, et cetera, is called general purpose AI. And we differentiate systems, AI systems, from AI models. So the AI system is what is implemented in a, uh, they say like uh, there is a user interface, for example, ChatGPT could be an, AI system because it's a model implemented into a, a digital system, an interface, a server, etc. And the model is the model itself. So they they um, regulate uh, the system and also the models in different ways. Um, so the mo AI models that are only for research, etc., are not again not uh, regulated. Uh, so now I will give uh, my my time to Migle. She will talk a little bit about opportunities. Yes, I have to use the micro. Uh, okay. Ah, no, no, no. Sorry. Uh, so uh, yes, my my task is to talk about the opportunities of the Artificial Intelligence Act. So, um, well, I'm coming from the law department, so we, I, I represent a little bit uh, a vision of the lawyers who see this act still as something work in progress. So we haven't seen the final version. So what we are talking about here is the version we have, which is not yet the last, the last version, right? We have, uh, this is the, uh, the, the document we refer to is, uh, is from uh, of January 2024. And we're still waiting for, for the final, final version, which means that you know, the final world still has to be, has to be uh, so to say, agreed upon, right? So the final, how the act looks like is still, uh, is still debated. However, we have already, uh, well, I, in, in my part of this, of this uh, I think very, very, very nice and, and great initiative that Manuel has invited uh, me and other, other members to, to participate in, is a good also occasion for us to talk about what kind of opportunities it offers. And then my, my colleagues will, will talk more in detail about the impact and what we should, and how we should do, and how we should start acting around uh, with, the, with the reference reference to this act. So here are a few opportunities that I wanted to, to talk to you about. So basically, yes, we, see, we have them. Uh, basically related to the open source, to artificial intelligence literacy, uh, to sandboxes and real life testing, which again is very important for the research community. And uh, uh, then uh, about the small and medium enterprises and startups, which again universities are the right place to, uh, to give birth to those. And also to talk a little bit also about the institutional role and scientific panels. So I focus on what is important for the research community of the Pompeu Fabra. Of course, there are many more things to talk about, and from the legal perspective, 
well, we, we could stay here or, well, for the rest of the, of the course. Yet there are only a few, so I, I want you to, to, to understand that, you know, we are taking out of the very complicated document, document certain pieces and zooming them in, but they, of course, need to be <coughs> taken into account within the wider context of the whole, of the whole uh, regulation. So, uh, in terms of, uh, I stopped functioning. Okay. Yes, <laughs> in terms of artificial intelligence literacy, so we have to understand that we are talking not simply about the new regulation, but we are talking about the new ecosystem of artificial intelligence where many, uh, where uh, it is no longer kind of, you know, technical matter that someone else will take care of. Uh, but actually, uh, the regulation does call into, does highlight the need for every, for the, not only uh, for the providers, deployers, uh, and the rest of the, you know, scientific community to be aware of, of what they are doing, and also commercial actors, but also for the rest of the society to be kind of uh, aware of what is going on. Because uh, if we, if people don't understand where, w what the problem is, right, if they don't understand how the algorithms work, so they cannot make decisions, they don't understand, right, and can be eventually, you know, if you don't understand, you don't participate in the decision making, well, this, the decisions are being made in, for you and uh, as, you, as, as, as the slide reads, and not necessarily in your interests, and of course, never in your interests. So this is where I think uh, our, our role as the researchers, as the university community comes into play, because we are here, uh, I think the majority is from the technology, technology, information, communications, information technology department, right? But we do not, I don't know whether we have people from humanities and people from other departments uh, who also should be involved in this debate, because at the end of the day, it is not just the question for the technicians, right? So it's not only the, the question for people from e ECT, and I think it's a good occasion for us to think what kind of uh, role we as university are going to play in this. In the next slide, yes, uh, the, my focus is also about, about, the, about the open source. So what does it mean in terms of uh, open source uh, de technology development? What, what kind of uh, benefits does it have uh, for, the, for the open source community to continue working on the artificial intelligence? On the one hand, on the systems, and also on the general purpose artificial intelligence. Basically, well, it's also, the, we, as you can see in the slide, there are certain benefits to develop open source, right? But still, it, it, it always requires uh, compliance with the, copyright, uh, with the copyright directive and with the information on the training data because of everything that happened with the general purpose artificial intelligence models. Yet, there is a kind of intention from the European uh, Commission to foster and make it a little bit easier and a little bit more uh, restringent uh, for open source community to continue participating in development of artificial intelligence and sharing the, the outcomes of these, uh, of these, uh, of these systems. Uh, let me see whether it... Yes, it works. Okay, so now it works. Uh, so, also in the reference to the sandboxes, right, so the, these, these kind of uh, regulatory playgrounds for people to, to experiment and to figure out the, the functionalities uh, of, of their systems with regard to the new regulation. Uh, I think it is also very important for the research community because this is where uh, you can earn, gain legal certainty in whether your system is compliant. Again, sandboxes are only for the high-risk artificial intelligence systems, right? So, again, if, you, if you're thinking about the development of certain systems, these are uh, of high-risk systems that we haven't, uh, haven't introduced, but are systems related to, that are especially dangerous for the fundamental rights, safety and security, basically. But there are, again, the law gives the lists and gives a lot of details on that. So, uh, in these sandboxes are... Uh, 
places to see whether they are, uh, the, 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 the idea of the system is, is working properly and what kind of um, problems it might give rise to. And also involves many stakeholders, among which also we have this idea that uh, the, the research community should also be actively involved. And that also means not only research groups, institution centers, but also individual researchers. So I would say that is also something very, very important for us to, to think about. And it can, sandboxes can also, but not necessarily include real world testing. So we are going to see in the next slide what we talk about here. But uh, basically, uh, this is the sandboxes we are talking about when we talk about the risk identification, because once we identify risks, we have means to mitigate. If not, if the risk cannot be mitigating, such systems cannot be deployed, used, or put, put in the market, as they say it in the, in, the, in, the, in the regulation. And of course, there are specific requirements for the data, for systems in public interest, and of course, the, the regulations idea is that every country has at least one regulatory sandbox. Again, as in Spain, we have, we, we have the same rule with the general data protection regulation that every country has to have at least one national data protection agency, and we have two in Spain. So this is why the idea of the regulatory sandbox in Catalonia is not something that, well, should be, should be seen as, you know, a provocation or, or some sort of uh, crazy, uh, crazy idea, right? And the real world testing again might take place in the regulatory sandbox, but can also take place in the outside the labs uh, or in the in the simulated environments. Again, here the slides we are going to share with you, so I'm not entering into details on on more requirements, but they do uh, ask us as a researchers to comply with a very specific and detailed rules and be able to you know, give uh, information about how we, how we do this testing, who is involved, what kind of data is, uh, is being dealt with, and of course, all the, all the guarantees related to, uh, to, to uh, general data protection regulation do apply. And in particular, the Commission invites us and support, supports uh, to, to develop socially and environmentally beneficial uh, projects. So again, this is something, something for the research community to be, to be aware of. And of course, small and medium enter enterprises and startups, uh, another important area for the researchers to be, to be aware of. And actually, we should have kind of a very strong support from the, from the state, right, from the, from the, from the government. So actually, uh, the, the idea of the European Commission is that, well, these, these players should have not only a privileged role, but also, you know, have it a little bit easier than the big companies to participate in, the, in, this, well, uh, in this competition for, for gaining the, 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 the market share. And, of course, uh, participation in the advisory forums and also involvement in the artificial on-demand platform, artificial intelligence on-demand platform, European digital innovation hubs and other other, other tools that should be available for the, for the small and medium enterprises and, and, and the startups. And also, well, I'm, I'm finishing here because I'm, I'm, I'm taking too much time. No? <laughs> well, I, 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 this is only to talk about the, well, more institutional level. It's not only about, you know, complying with the law, but also being aware that uh, there are many new institutions that are work in progress they are still, uh, still being created. And if we, like, right now, as we have the Artificial Intelligence Act, it, in many parts it says it's still to be developed, it is still to be addressed, it is still, we have still to understand how we, we do this and how we do that, right? And all these institutions that, some of these institutions that you see on the blackboard are also work in progress. And they are to be created and they, they are especially scientific panels are also have to be identified, have to be built. So I, I think it is a very, very important part for the university community, you know, to, to keep an eye on these developments and be aware that uh, we, you can, we all can make our voices heard as individual researchers, researchers in, this institu in these institutions. And well, I, I myself, I'm in, involved in another European Commission's 
initiative. So just simply to say that we should not leave these decisions to be made by someone up there someplace in Brussels, but actually be much more involved in, 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 in these, these activities and, and the work that is being uh, carried out or is about to be carried out also on not only on the European but also national level where you can be involved in, in many uh, of these, of these uh, institutions and, and, uh, and uh, bodies. And that is it on my side, and I pass it to... Okay, thank you. Okay, my turn. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about the social impact of the AI Act uh, from a civil society perspective. So just a little bit of background. I am a member of Algorait, which is a community that promotes public participation in the field of AI technologies. Um, and we have been working on this file for the last past three years. Uh, we signed a letter in 2021 uh, to call for putting fundamental rights in the center of this regulation because we understood that um, AI could exacerbate imbalances uh, that already are in society, uh, affecting the most marginalized ones. We were thinking in cases such as the Compass algorithm or the Siri case. Uh, but I also work uh, for a consumer organization, which is called SECU, that is a federation of consumer. And from that point of view, we also start working uh, on the file, thinking of AI products and services, such as facial recognition tools or uh, virtual assistants, because we consider that AI could uh, put in risk uh, what is a consumer's autonomy or self-determination, etc. And mainly, we were thinking, for example, in, in social reco in media recommender systems. But uh, what happened in 2022 is that ChatGPT was launched to the general public, so regulators and civil society organizations uh, had to consider also generative AI in this file. Um, therefore, in, last year in 2023, uh, European consumer organizations uh, launched a campaign to raise a, a awareness of its risks, such as concentration of power. Uh, we all know that uh, these uh, models are being developed for, for a, a few companies. Uh, um, sorry, <laughs> wrong or inaccurate <laughs> outputs, uh, that we know that uh, there, are, there, have, there, ha there have been some cases uh, where the, the, the output is not uh, uh, accurate. Uh, or, uh, for example, deep fake and disinformation. And there is important to highlight, for example, that there is a report from Europol that said that by, uh, by 2026, 90% uh, of the deep fake uh, uses, is, uh, sorry, uh, deep fake uses is going to be 90% 90, uh, 90 by 2026. So, um, and there is another report from uh, Sensity that said that 90% of uh, deep fakes are sexually. Uh, pictures uh, of women without consent. So this shows the, the kind of problems that we are facing as a society. So um, with that in mind, um, we have to ask what is the main focus of this regulation. So as Manuel already explained, the, the AI has a, a risk-based approach and the main obligations are uh, established on what is called AI, um, uh, high-risk AI systems which are listed in Annex 2, uh, that is connected with other European regulations, such as, for example, the medical device regulation, are in Annex 3, that in this case is the one that is interesting for us, uh, which sets forth a list, a list of areas in which the use of AI system is considered high risk. However, this is not simple enough, because uh, this was something that was um, discussed until the last minutes of the final test, text or what is considered to be the final text. Uh, so even though they are listed, uh, AI system uh, won't be considered high risk if they do not post uh, a risk uh, to uh, fundamental rights, uh, health or safety and do not materially influence on decision making. As this was not clear enough, the law gives some examples, uh, such as uh, an AI system that is intended to perform a preparatory task or a limited task. Uh, but uh, still, it's not clear enough, so the European Commission has to release guidelines uh, to explain this word in a little bit uh, better. But something that was uh, very concerned from civil society's perspective is that we are talking about self-assessment. So the one that is going to decide 
if um, the system is high, high risk or not is the provider. Um, and they have to uh, register that, uh, that evaluation in a, in, a, in a public database, but still we, uh, what uh, I want to highlight is that it's not automatically high risk. High risk. They have to self-assess the, the risk of the, the AI. The AI, sorry, the AI. Um, so uh, so uh, after understanding the different layers of filter, filters that the law has in terms of uh, the definition of AI, the classification of AI, now we can see what is inside an Annex 3. I'm not going to go through all uh, the list, but here is uh, the, the complete list that includes AI systems in the areas of biometrics or, or, or education, in employment, access to public services, etc. Um, so in, in case that um, the provider is developing uh, an AI system in those areas, they have to comply with some obligations. Uh, these obligations fr from the provider size uh, are uh, listed there, but from, from a civil society perspective, uh, the main ones are that they have to put in place a risk manage management system, uh, that this should include to, uh, the evaluation of, uh, of the negative impact, impact of the system on minors and vulnerable groups. Another obligation that is important for us is the human oversight, and that they have to um, put in place data governance systems that uh, include uh, taking measures to prevent and avoid uh, data identifying, uh, sorry, identifying biases. So this uh, is something uh, very important from, from a civil society perspective, and this is a point where we can see an interaction with the GDPR uh, that we will have to analyze in practice. Uh, another obligation that is important in terms of, of, of accountability is that the provider has to regist register uh, the system in a public database. And from the deployer side, they have to uh, comply with other obligations, such as ensuring that the, the human oversight is competent or has the authority, but also conduct the, funda um, the data protection impact, uh, impact assessment. And this is another connection with the GDPR. But uh, what, what was very important for, from a civil society perspective was the fundamental rights impact assessment that we need to um, know that it wasn't uh, added in the first draft, uh, draft of the regulation, it was added uh, later by the parliament, and this is something that we support from the civil society and that they, the deployers now have to, to do. But not all the, the deployers, but only the deployers that are public authorities or uh, private entities that provide public services or uh, operators that use uh, high-risk AI systems in the areas of uh, financials and insurance. Um, and another thing that is interesting to highlight is that uh, they also have to register in a public database if, if uh, they are uh, public authorities. So also important in terms of accountability and transparency. Uh, reaching this part of the presentation, we need to ask what about the other AI systems that are not considered high risk? Well, the law requires for some of them that are considered medium, medium risk transparency, transparency measures. So for providers that, uh, of AI systems that inter can interact with people like a chatbot or provider uh, of uh, an AI system that, that can generate a, a synthetic con content that could be the case of ChatGPT, and deployers of uh, motion recognition systems or uh, bio, uh, categories, uh, biometric categorization systems and deployers on, of systems that can generate synthetic content, they have to put in place these transparency measures that depending on the case could be informing people that they are interacting with the machine or uh, marking the content as generated. So these are the transparency obligations for the medium risk AI. Um, um, then, as Manuel already explained, the law has uh, a list of um, practices that are forbidden uh, because uh, the regulators consider that are against uh, the European values, values uh, and uh, the fundamental rights. So here there is the list of, um, of banned practices, and maybe there are two that uh, it's interesting to highlight. That is the real-time biometric identification 
and the motion recognition system. So in terms of real-time biometric identification in public spaces, uh, this, wa this was something that uh, was very controversial during the negotiations because it's actually facial recognition uh, in public spaces and in the end was uh, banned with uh, some exemptions. Uh, but the, uh, what uh, we need to consider is um, the, the fundamental rights that, that might be affected in terms uh, in, in case that this uh, system is used uh, and we need to think in the right to um, um, Per, sorry, <laughs> right to uh, privacy, data protection, and chilling effects uh, on freedoms of thought, manifestation, association, etc. And from uh, the motion recognition system, uh, the regulators consider that in the workplace and uh, in educational institutions, uh, there is a, a, an imbalance of power, so uh, the use of these cases in this area could lead to uh, discriminatory effects or uh, also have a chilling effect on freedoms. So that's why uh, these uh, practices are uh, forbidden under the, the AI Act. And uh, in terms of general purpose AI, as it was already explained, this was added in the regulation uh, after the launch of ChatGPT. And uh, the, there is a new category of risk here because uh, depending on uh, if the general purpose AI has systemic risk or not, that, uh, the law imposes different obligations. So in the first case, we can see that uh, if it is a model without systemic risk, they have to put in place technical documentation, share it with, um, with the downstream developers and also respect copyright. But uh, if we are talking about uh, a general purpose AI with systemic risk, they have to comply with that, but also assess the system and uh, assess and mitigate risk, ensure um, cybersecurity, etc. Um, we could see, we could, we could think of the case of ChatGPT, as Manuel already explained. Uh, ChatGPT is a system. GPT is the model, and uh, it could be said that GPT-3 is not gonna or might not be a, a model with systemic risk, but GPT-4 might be one with systemic risk and have to comply with stricter obligations. Um, Last but not least, <laughs> we need also to consider the interaction uh, of the AII with other, other regulations. Uh, I listed uh, there some uh, of uh, these laws. I'm not going to go through all of them, but, but maybe it's interesting to highlight uh, the GDPR um, because there are some interactions in terms of uh, biometrics and, and how to put in place, for example, uh, biometric systems that are high risk but also in terms, for example, uh, of uh, automatic, automatic decision making, because uh, as I already explained, this law requires a human uh, on the loop. So is, is that the case where, where um, we are not uh, mainly in front of uh, an automatic decision making, so uh, the GDPR might not apply. So this uh, would be uh, like, uh, interpreted in the in practice. So we need to see how these uh, two laws are going to interact. And uh, uh, another one that is interesting is the medical devices regulation that is uh, listed under Annex 2. So uh, the, the, it's also considered high risk, uh, but under Annex 2. And uh, they have to comply also with the conformity assessment of the medical uh, devices regulation and the AI Act. So this could lead to overlapping and problems with the interpretation. So in the end, the European, the European Commission has also to release some guidelines to uh, explain how this uh, law interacts with the laws that are listed under Annex 2. So uh, I think that's it. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, well, as we was mentioned, uh, it's not mandatory to apply all the the law of AI Act in the research area, but uh, however, it's very connected nowadays the uh, research that we done in computer science with the industry. So if the, we later develop a, a company or a spin-off and whatever, we need to follow these, uh, these regulations. So um, we recommend to follow different uh, points 
to uh, guide uh, the work that you are doing right now in your research uh, areas. So, I don't know. Yeah. We define uh, some recommendation uh, regarding the AI uh, principles and we will explain and of course if you have any question we can talk about that. But it could be a great uh, start to define different uh, detailed document the, the documentation and a record keeping all the time all the code and the step that you are developing your different algorithms. Why? Because it, if later you have an auditory or, or you have to explain uh, how you work in your research and in your algorithm, uh, this type of repository will be very useful. So establish a documentation repository um, to have a management system or that, uh, that uh, ensure that you have all the step appropriate recorder. Uh, it could be very useful and also to provide a clear documentation of all your uh, system, AI, AI system. The other recommendation is um, to define in your research group a code of conduct. This means that you have uh, ethical principle and ethical uh, step uh, that you will follow in your research group. Because when you start in a new project, you need to define different methodology. And this is part of a good uh, uh, a scientific uh, uh, efficiency to have this type of uh, a step to follow in, in the framework of your project. So this make you ensure that you uh, system you will, will be more responsible, fair, and transparent uh, uh, for all the process. So um, this is, of course, voluntary, but it's a, it's a good start to, uh, to define this type of uh, uh, code in, in your research group. The other thing is, uh, as it was mentioned uh, um, by Migle, um, we have the different committees in the university regarding ethics. And it's good to define which, which are the, the members that are part of these committees to identify uh, if you want to ask about a certain point in your project. As we, want, uh, as we was mentioned by uh, Manuel, we also have this type of uh, form where you can send the specific uh, um, yes, uh, issues that you have in your project. And we, in, you, we could uh, give support uh, to foster this culture of uh, um, responsible AI. So um, it's good to be, it could be great to, uh, to define this type of uh, committee expert uh, on ethical AI. The other thing is, of course, to have a human-centered design. This means that to think about the development system regarding uh, the needs of the society, the, the, what the people uh, require, uh, which type of thing could be useful for our environment, our society. So, and of course, in, 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 a, in a human center view. So regarding uh, the social and environmental well-being uh, and um, about this principle of human agency, um, of course, uh, nowadays we have this problem of balancing innovation and the ethical consideration. But we need uh, to uh, innovate uh, respecting the ethical uh, recommendation of, of course, following the AI Act. And, and this could be uh, very important for, to respect the fundamental rights, avoiding bias, and ensure the fairness in our design. So we need to balance this, uh, this culture of innovate faster with uh, the reminding that we need to respect and evaluate our uh, system. Um, other important point that uh, it was mentioned already is that we need to cooperate with different experts in different areas to introduce more people from human uh, science, sociology, ethics, law, and other relevant disciplines uh, to address these uh, social and ethical challenges that we have in AI. 
because all, all are experts in different fields and we need to be more connected. And as a research groups and in university, it's fundamental to, to, to collaborate uh, in interdisciplinary. Um, of course, uh, there are uh, a classification of uh, our uh, risk and in our research projects is non mandatory, but we need to follow this type of uh, assessment. And a good practice that we recommend is to develop uh, different exercises uh, where you can um, evaluate in which uh, fundamental right on sustainable development goals you could have an impact. For example, um, you know that the United Nations de defined these uh, 17 goals regarding education, poverty, and gender balance, industry, and, and so on. It could be very useful to be conscious about that and also to, to um, defining your project, in your research, in which area you could affect or have a negative or positive, of course, uh, implications. And you have a different indicator regarding that where you can um, def uh, yes, uh, organize your project. Um, another thing that is very uh, useful is identify best practices on AI in your uh, research field. And also to review uh, the different reported incident in, in your research field that it is, is, is happening right now to prevent negative impact. Also, there are different tools and methodology uh, that you can check. This is, uh, was developed uh, for human rights assessment. It's for the organization of BSR organization that uh, explained that we need to scope uh, how many people we uh, could affect uh, in we, uh, which type of scale of our risk could uh, happen in our research. And there are uh, another also useful tools that is F o a OACD, that is uh, the incident monitors where you can check the different incidents of AI regarding the AI principles. This is very useful and is uh, concerning to the AI uh, problems in Europe particularly. And you have also this tool of USA where you have a, a database that is open with different incidents that are happening right now in relation to human rights. And you can check maybe which type of problem that are happening in your research uh, area. And also to focus in social good, uh, of course. So the other point that it was already mentioned uh, too, it was about uh, AI literacy and the awareness about the research in our research group about the ethical pro, uh, con, um, definition principle. So it could be great to organize different workshops and also to participate in this type of seminar and you can organize your personalized uh, um, programs to incorporate this uh, ethical and responsibility in, in, in your research. Also uh, regarding universities, um, universities like Stanford, Harvard, and of course in, in here in Spain, are um, introducing in the curriculum the different ethical and social aspects uh, in the program because it's very important to uh, define this type of uh, point of view, not just with a course mandatory in all the curriculum, and it's very important to contribute with other groups. So the other thing is to define a, a guide, a guide dance uh, to, to, for the user where we can explain the, the clear and compressive information how it will, is to use our tool and our, uh, um, yes, our product that we are defining. And this could be uh, very uh, useful also for the civil organization and so on. Uh, of course, it's very important to prioritize diversity uh, in, in your research teams. Uh, the variety of perspective could be uh, very important to promote a, a more equal and inclusive uh, result. And also, uh, as you know, all the universities have uh, the gender commission and the equity, diversity, and inclusion 
a, a commission, so it's very important also to connect with them and to establish internal committee to uh, over to review the the different protocols and to have also a different measure if we have a negative consequence with certain population. Finally, it's very important to have a participatory evaluation with different groups and involve our society in the assessment of our AI system. Uh, this means to investigate about the emergency form of the algor our algorithm could um, make uh, a certain groups vulnerable. And for example, if we are working in human resources uh, algorithms, we can uh, work with different groups of uh, um, uh, of people in Barcelona that are searching for uh, jobs and so on to introduce them in this uh, development uh, and, and to, to know about their opinion. And of course, uh, this means to foster collaboration with NGOs, companies, diverse uh, civil organizations, as we was mentioned today, Algo right and SECU is, uh, is very important to connect with people and population and how our system are developed and not just to involve, uh, just to inform or to ask uh, as consultant. It's very important to collaborate and to empower people and population in the uh, uses of AI systems. So this is how our main uh, recommendation to start in your research groups and we hope that it could be useful to start as well. It's not mandatory, it's a good uh, way to, to follow this. Thank you. Thank you, the three of you. Uh, it was really interesting. Um, so, thank you all. Um, as I said before, you have this uh, form that you can fill, also you have our emails. Uh, also, if you want to contact Annabelle, you can ask me for, for her email. Uh, but now we have some time, like almost half an hour, uh, because the idea was to see uh, if you have questions, if you have ideas regarding projects that you are uh, involved. Uh, you, I know that you, you send some answers in, your, in, the, in the registration that we have read and maybe uh, we can address them, but uh, well, I want to hear about your 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 idea. Thank you.